Thank you, Patricia, for the introduction. I'm Scott Mazzarandino, and I'm excited about the opportunity to address the AI for Cybersecurity Conference this year and to discuss the important role artificial intelligence is and will continue to play in securing our critical networks, private data, and intellectual property. I've been working in cybersecurity for over 10 years, helping to secure some of our nation's most critical networks in the commercial and federal space. As part of Blue Vector's founding team of engineers, data scientists, and cybersecurity operators within Northrop Grumman, I was motivated by our customers' challenge to develop a technology capable of identifying malware before it was seen in the wild, to put in place a defense that could, for once, be ahead of the threat. Something strategic with the potential to disrupt an adversary who is prepared to bring the fullest extent of their cunning to the chess game that is cybersecurity. And so began my journey on applying artificial intelligence to cybersecurity. But more on that later. First, I'd like to take a moment to consider why such a bold challenge was necessary at all. As a former NSA deputy director once stated, if we were to score cybersecurity the way we score soccer, the tally would be 462 to 456 20 minutes into the game. In other words, all offense. Of course, he was speaking of the game as played by nation states. For those of us without the legal means to fight back, the score would be more like 462 to zero. The only reason why we might not have lost yet is that the other team hasn't decided to take the field against us. I don't mean to sound overly bleak, but we need to look no further than the recent events surrounding the Solar Winds hack and the subsequent confirmed compromise of thousands, yes, thousands of companies and government agencies some of the biggest and most sophisticated in the world to prove just how effective an attacker can be against even the most well-funded defenses. Like any sport, however, when you lose, it's not just the skill and inventiveness and execution of your opponent that matter, but also how well you play and the levelness of the playing field itself. And in cybersecurity, the playing field is not fair. To try and level this playing field, defenders have been investing in and relying on technology for decades. Let's consider the evolution in detection technology in particular. In the beginning, there were signatures. Cybersecurity was just emerging from the primordial ooze. The focus was on developing static identifiers that could easily be shared amongst thousands of individuals and companies. This early form of detection was effective at establishing a type of herd immunity against amongst participants in the share. Sure, there were a few who had to suffer for the benefit of the many, but after that, things were relatively safe. Then adversaries evolved. They began to develop uh, techniques like polymorphism and rapidly spreading worms, designed to defeat the static and relatively slow nature of the signature sharing. And so the next stage of defensive evolution was triggered. Defenders began to focus on the behavior of the suspect software rather than on the static properties that could be identified by signatures or hashes. Sandboxing is introduced as well as behavioral heuristics on endpoints. After a period of success for these technologies, adversaries once again began to adapt. They introduced anti-sandbox and, and VM-aware features into the malware designed to bypass this dynamic analysis. The level of anti-AV features and malware increased to avoid behavioral monitoring at the endpoint. At this point, defenders are starting to wonder if there is some technology out there that could just adapt to new malware features automatically, something downright futuristic. Enter the third stage of defensive technology evolution, the age of artificial intelligence. The war of the machines is on. Everyone is hyped about the potential for AI to transform how we detect and hunt for adversaries in our networks. New AI-driven startups spring to life. New products flood the market. People start trusting the math. And then users start to realize that the age of AI doesn't quite look like our friend, the T-800, but something a little bit closer to this. A lot of hype, a fair amount of confusion, and a difficult to articulate value proposition relative to established technologies. Let's take a look back at that early stage of detection development. The early protozoic life of signatures and packet filters designed for sharing and to establish herd immunity through mass distribution. Every customer got the same set of signatures and the same signature evaluation engine, the lock on the door to our networks. 
the bad guys quickly figured out that they could buy the same lock. They could play with it in their basements and intelligence headquarters until their software could easily bypass it. When I said earlier that cybersecurity does not have a fair playing field, this is a perfect example. Here, the attacker not only gets to pick the time and target of the attack, but they get a priori access to the defense as well. No wonder it's easy to score. So what happened when the next stage of evolution comes along? Yes, we have a better lock, but we distribute it in exactly the same way. Everyone gets the same copy, including the bad guys. Once again, it's only a matter of time before these methods are rendered nearly ineffective. All right, so AI finally starts to show up and what happens? Are we going to follow the same pattern of developing engines and distributing the same learning models to everyone? Some will. They'll take their better lock and distribute it in the same fashion as previous technologies distributed theirs. The flaw in the logic is pretty obvious. We need to stop letting the bad guys get a copy of the defenses. We need to find a way to get, give different locks to everyone, including the bad guy. I call this concept a moving defense. It's moving because it changes as the adversary moves from enterprise to enterprise and also can change within a given enterprise over time as they figure out ways to change and alter their individual locks. The important thing is that everyone's defenses are different and that the bad guy doesn't get a complete copy of anyone's. The days when they can just test their malware and know that it'll work and remain undetected when they launch it against a variety of targets would be over. If there's any doubt that this is what the adversaries are doing, you just have to look at the malware itself. You can literally see the case statements where they're looking for individual uh, AV technologies or sandboxes, sometimes by name of the vendor, and changing or altering the way that that malware operates if those are found. And I, as a software developer, know I've never released any code that I haven't tested. So if it's in the code, you know they were testing it against those technologies to make sure it worked. As I said, this is not a mind-blowing idea, but there are some pretty good reasons why it has not happened yet. First, how are we supposed to make different locks for every customer? Sounds time-consuming and expensive to me. And even if we could make them, how could you make them, how could you make sure that all the different locks are sufficiently unique yet have the same effectiveness? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be the one to get the second best lock. And here is where AI will break the mold. AI provides the means to achieve a moving defense. It doesn't guarantee it. One can still use AI to keep the old distribution models and people have, but it does offer the opportunity. With AI, you can learn from your environment. The data used to build the model is unique to each network and therefore the models will be unique. If done carefully, these models can also achieve nearly identical high performance against standard verification stats. This statistical equivalence means no one needs to get the second best lock. Everyone can get an equally effective one. So with careful design of modeling engines, data curation and feature engineering, we can begin to level that playing field. And I think that is the charge to this conference and to you as individuals to make sure that that happens. So what does this mean for where we are with applying artificial intelligence to cybersecurity? Well, I think we are somewhere more like this, right? We are not quite at the T800 level yet, but we are moving beyond the vendor stage and into a world where we are changing longstanding practices of distributing the same detection models to everyone. And I think our future is bright here with AI and I look forward to discussing some of the unique ways that we're applying artificial intelligence for cybersecurity at Blue Vector. And with that, I'd like to invite my colleague, Rick Mishna, up to ask a few questions. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate the humor and the monologue. The folks at the Tonight Show might wanna hire you on pretty quickly. <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> Perfect, I think that would be good. I'll be the sidekick. I'll be the, <laughs> I'll be sitting on the couch next to you. So, Scott, you spoke about the potential for artificial intelligence to make a strategic difference in the balance of power between the good guys and the bad guys and put the two on a more equal playing field, making the score not 
400 and something to zero, but making it far closer. So while that is an interesting insight, what have you done to make that a reality? Yeah, and it's not just about making that score closer, but also just making it lower, right? And that's really the value in the defense. And at Blue Vector, we've been developing novel ways of applying supervised machine learning in particular to the detection of malware. We've been doing it for almost a decade now. So that's much earlier than uh, you know, many have uh, begun trumpeting machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, in their marketing brochures. And while there are many ways AI is getting applied to cybersecurity ecosystem today, malware detection was amongst the first to be ready for prime time. And Blue Vector was the first product to offer an AI-based malware detection capability at the network level. Uh, we built and continue to improve on an AI-based malware detection engine that can analyze samples in milliseconds, not minutes, allowing, use, uh, allowing users to scan every file seen by the network in near real time with unsurpassed precision and recall. We then went a step further and developed a patented technology to perform the supervised learning process in a completely automated fashion without the need to send sensitive data files off our customer networks. And we have customers with some of the most sensitive networks in the world. And that the ones that originally set that challenge before us operated some of those very sensitive networks. And file sharing, while it is more common today is something that is still not allowed for them. And they needed this ability to operate completely on premise. And you know, doing machine learning in that fashion and doing supervised machine learning in that fashion is particularly challenging. And uh, you know, I think we've, we've gone a long way in cracking that nut uh, with our in situ machine learning capability within the Blue Vector Advanced Threat Detection product. So Scott, Blue Vector primarily focuses on supervised learning techniques. Are those the best? Yes, you're, you're correct. Of course, we, we do uh, focus on using uh, supervised machine learning te techniques within our ATD product. Um, as for being the best, you know, I think it's the best at solving the zero-day malware detection problem. You know, AI is like any other tool set. You have to pick the right tool for this, from the set for the job at hand. You know, AI has much broader applications to cybersecurity than just malware detection. In fact, malware detection and supervised learning is not even the most popular application today. Unsupervised learning used in anomaly detection for threat hunting has become more common as people uh, focus more on finding existing breaches in their network. It's become fashionable even to say that we should all just assume our networks are compromised. You know, I personally don't believe we should all give up on pre-breach or early breach detection as it still provides the most effective way of limiting or eliminating our adversaries time in our networks. The focus on threat hunting using anomaly detection, user entity behavioral analytics, or tradecraft based heuristics is certainly an important insurance policy and security best practice. But I always remind people that a good day for your hunting team is still a really bad day for your CISO because he's the one that's gonna have to report that there's been a breach and that it's been going on for days, weeks, or months. And in some ways, you know, the sort of the horse has already left the barn. I don't envy the CISOs that are out there having to deal with that. What are some of the greatest challenges you see in getting artificial intelligence to have a bigger role in cybersecurity? Well, if you listen to the vendor marketing, you think AI was all over cybersecurity. The reality is that it's there, but does face some major hurdles to adoption. Even the products that do the AI well are often still being used by security operators more for visibility than for their detection capabilities and are only trusted if they can be confirmed by other more basic techniques such as signatures or cyber intelligence indicators of compromise. AI adoption is challenging for really two fundamental reasons. First, the alerting mechanisms are at their core statistical, meaning that given some number of evaluations, there is an expected number of false positives. Yeah, I mentioned this concept earlier about statistical equivalency, uh, allowing models, you know, different models that behave differently, perhaps even using different feature sets, to be considered equivalent because they have the same relative performance against a verification set. But in operational use, uh, this statistical 
behavior of the detection models uh, does present some challenges. Uh, and it's something that has not been historically true of other detection techniques such as signatures, uh, which tend to have actually relatively few false positives, but suffer greatly from false negatives. And given that most networks aren't actually in a continuous state of breach or under a continuous state of, of attack, what most cybersecurity analysts and SOC operators deal with are the false positives. They're, these are the alerts of the detection engine when really nothing bad or, or uh, no real adversarial activity is going on within the network. And this leads to an erosion of trust in the detection engine. For example, let's just say I had a model that had both a 0.1% simultaneous false positive and false negative rate. As a data scientist, I'd probably I'd be super happy, right? I mean, I'd probably even be a little concerned about overfitting, right? Because it's just too good to be true, getting a model with that great of performance. But now in operations, that same model needs to perform, you know, let's say 100,000 evaluations a day. You know, and in some things, it might be looking at network flows. It might even be 10 times or 100 times this. And on a clean network, statistically, you would still expect about 100 false positives a day. And that means an analyst is getting 100 alerts a day, all of which are false positives. Put it that way and it doesn't seem so, so good. Now take a signature that might have a 0% false positive rate, but a 99% false negative rate. Those same 100,000 evaluations result in zero alerts and zero false positives. Now add in one truly malicious event. The AI engine catches it with 99.9% .9 likelihood, almost certainty. The signature has a 1% chance of catching it. So it probably doesn't. And I wouldn't want to hang my hat on that. But because the analysts experience the false positives, but not the risk of the false negative, all the perceived value is in being low false positive. But that's not how a data scientist measures success. So there's a pretty big disconnect between operational value and how we measure the effectiveness of AI models. So everyone using AI for detection, whether pre or post breach, needs to find a way of sustaining a low false negative rate while not driving away analysts. The second challenge is analysts, like most humans, find it hard to trust something they don't understand. I don't mean they don't understand the data science behind the AI, which is true, you know, most of them then don't. Uh, but they are willing to give that the benefit of the doubt. They're willing to kind of trust the math a little bit. What they're not so willing to do is trust an alert where they don't understand the cybersecurity reasoning behind it. Since most AI models are opaque, meaning that they can't explain why they've come to some conclusion in a way that is satisfying to the user, analysts tend to need or want additional verification. But as soon as you add this verification step in, you're now no better then your weakest link, that verification step. Again, usually this reliance on signatures or IOCs, or perhaps very time consuming manual evaluation of network log data to do that uh, verification, something bad actually is going on. And that's why providing context and not confirmation is key to success with the application of AI models in real cybersecurity use cases. The analyst leveraging their training has to be able to see the bad activity happening so that they come to trust the alerting mechanism and also so they will elevate it and get the problem fixed within their network. The AI-based analysis is there to just help them focus on the needle in the haystack, but few will let the AI just declare a needle as if, because that has some real business implications. So Rick, Thanks do you have any that. other questions? <laughs> Thanks for that, Scott. Actually, say that again. That way she can clear that. We'll start from there. So, Rick, do you have any other questions? I do have one more question. You know, you spoke a lot about how artificial intelligence is being used for malware detection, zero-day malware, anomaly detection, you know, across the gambit, all the different use cases. But I'm curious about the living off the land or fileless malware attempts. Could you explain that and and, and maybe show us how AI or tell us how AI is being used for that today? Yes, so you know, fileless attacks are certainly uh, you know, one of the more common vectors that we see today in the wild uh, for malware. And it's an interesting misnomer. 
uh, because fileless attacks pretty much always include some sort of a file when you get down to it. What it really refers to, the term, uh, is that this uh, malware or broader attack vector uh, doesn't leave any file-based artifact on the endpoint. And it's originally designed as sort of an AV evasion technology. Uh, you know, AVs watch, uh, typically watch the file system for changes. When a file gets created, they scan it. And so if you don't create any files, right, you don't get scanned. And that's sort of the genesis of this attack. Uh, and it is uh, oftentimes related to the use of existing tools on the system or leverages existing tools on the system, uh, oftentimes script execution engine. So in the Windows world, PowerShell is often uh, very much associated with fileless attacks. And that can be uh, challenging for a lot of reasons because it, it is a legitimate administration tool. So you can't just buy everything using PowerShell. And the challenge that the detection engines face in trying to find fileless attacks are, are sort of twofold. Um, one is, you know, can you detect the attack early enough before it has a chance to leverage, say, a file list portion of the attack? Um, so we do see a lot of things that are termed fileless attack that actually only a portion of the attack is fileless. The beginning of the attack might come from a weaponized Word document set in the phishing email. Uh, in order to establish that beachhead, uh, which has been, uh, after which they then leverage things like PowerShell to continue the attack. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, doing a good job at, at scanning and preventing those. And that can be done using traditional techniques, both at the, the endpoint and, and network level. Uh, the more cunning fileless attacks, uh, which are, are, are challenging, is at the network level, um, where there's perhaps a phishing email that starts it, but it directs you to a web page that then begins a chain of exploitation. And this landing page uh, begins by profiling the endpoint uh, and then downloading some sort of exploit. So this is a, a traditional attack via exploit kits. And this is uh, difficult to, to deal with at the network level or at the endpoint level, and very difficult to deal with at the uh, network level, and changes a lot. It's very dynamic, these uh, you know landing pages. Uh, there, there's few IOCs are written in time. So you need to be able to understand how the web page uh, is behaving. And this is where AI comes in. If you can understand the activity within these web pages, these, these uh, landing pages for exploit kit delivery, you can begin to detect them, uh, whether at the endpoint or at the network level. And to do that, you really need an engine that is capable of understanding how the dynamic portions of web pages driven by JavaScript uh, are behaving, be able to, to gather features uh, from that behavior, uh, build models based on you know, known exploit kit landing pages and other known malicious JavaScript, uh, and then give a, a result. And uh, you know, the challenge a lot of that is challenging, but the real challenge is the one I, I kind of mentioned earlier with the number of evaluations a model has to go through. Uh, and, you know, JavaScript at an enterprise level is seen not 100,000 times a day, but millions to tens of millions of times a day. So the fidelity of your machine learning model needs to be incredibly high, as well as your ability to uh, extract, identify, and build the JavaScript itself in order to perform the analysis at all. And then you have to be able to do that at line rate. So there's nothing easy about doing fileless uh, detection at a network level. Um, it's hard at the endpoint as well. Uh, the good news is that, you know, at least we at Blue Vector have, you know, sort of cracked that knot. We've, we've spent years and have patented technologies uh, dedicated to solving this fileless uh, detection problem at the network level. So you can apply it across systems uh, that don't you don't have the opportunity to put in an advanced endpoint capability that could do it within the browsers at the endpoint. So you can get full network coverage using a blue vector technology at the network level. Thank you, Scott. That's great. Thank you, AI4 Cybersecurity Summit. And thanks everyone for coming to this session. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you to the Blue Vector team. That was stupendous.